I always would like to wrestle this thing away from George before he gets carried away. <laughs> I love this event. First, because I get to hang out with a lot of old friends, and I also meet a lot of new friends. And if you want new friends, this is a wonderful group to hang out with. And also, every year, <clears throat> they let me introduce the speaker. Now tonight, I have the honor of introducing two men that I absolutely love. The first, of course, is Dr. Joe Stokes. Every year he comes here, and we are enriched by his performances. You uh, read a little of the bio of Dr. Stokes in your program. He's also a Chautauqua lecturer. You know, that really impresses me. But even more than him being a very fine researcher and scholar, he is a generous, gracious man. He is the epitome of a Southern gentleman. And tonight, he is going to portray another man I love, Major General Henry Lee. But those of us in this area know him as Light Horse Harry, who rode with Francis Marion. Now, he is a colorful character. And when he went to Princeton, he was considered to have a certain genius. And when he organized the Lee's Legion, uh, and it was very successful, he expected men to follow him because he was smarter than they were, braver than they were, and better than they were. Don't you just love a man with that kind of confidence? <laughs> um, tonight, we will meet Major General Henry Lee in his later years. He was badly injured, his health was very poor, he went to the Barbados, and now, realizing that he is approaching the end of his life, he is now journeying back to the States. So please welcome Major General Henry Lee, our own Light Horse Harry. Keep my balance these days. 
I look back on the time when I was when I was strong. You know, you know I never was I never was big and powerful. I'm a little man in size, in physique. I didn't have much strength except in my heart and in my brain. I'm a Lee. A Lee from Virginia. I was born up there, near the little town nearby is Dumfries, but they call that old area up there Leesville. My father was anxious that I that I reach my full potential. He was concerned about my education. And so when I was 14, he sent me to Princeton to the college. Well, Dr. Witherspoon was the president of the college. You know, he, he later went to the, to the Congress and, and, and he voted for the Declaration of Independence. I knew a lot of people who had voted for the Declaration of Independence, some of them named Lee. But he was my teacher, and he had voted that way. We used, to, we used to laugh about that before I knew how to really appreciate. Particularly, what, the brightest student in my class, you know, was the son of other educators, and his name was Aaron Burr. And he was in my class, and, and he loved to make fun of people. And as you know, what has happened to Aaron along the way is he, he's had his ups and downs. Well, you know, I have too. The student that I liked the most and, and was friendly with most of my life after college was uh, the, my fellow Virginian, James Madison. He too has had ups and downs. James, <laughs> I tell you that I've been small. James was really small. I was bigger than James. Smarter than James too. But he had his ups. He stuck with Thomas Jefferson. And as time went on in politics, in Virginia and elsewhere, I realized that Thomas Jefferson, while he he seemed to be a man of knowledge and ability. He was not a good speaker, and I didn't think he was a good thinker. And as time went on, you know, I followed, the, I followed against Thomas Jefferson, and that meant that I had to be against my friend James Madison. Yeah, I graduated from Princeton when I was 17. It was time to, to fight for liberty. We had actually taken up arms against the King of England. The King of England had accused us all of being traitors. And so we responded by establishing in our own government. We did in Virginia. <laughs> we were the Commonwealth of Virginia in those days. We are a state now. Well, maybe I should say they are a state now because I haven't been to Virginia in five years. Well, as, as, as a young hothead might be, I was anxious to get into the, to the fighting. You had to fight for liberty. You have to fight for whatever you want that you think is worth fighting for. I appealed to the governor of Virginia. He made me wait a year until I was old enough. Uh, that was Patrick Henry. And, and he appointed me as a colonel in the Virginia Guards. And so I was ready to go off and go to war. And the Virginia Guards were taken over by the Continentals. And a fellow Virginian, you know, George Washington. Now, there's a big man for you. A big, powerful, strong man who who spent most of his life out of doors. 
Another man who knew what his mind told him to know and acted on it and didn't change his mind and didn't change his actions either. I was there with others of the troops round about. We were in Cambridge, Massachusetts for a while. I, I, I was anxious to fight. I, I didn't, I was, not, I was not around in the earliest days. George Washington almost lost all, all of our hopes in military victory in the first days. I know he was a big man and a powerful man, but he wasn't a general yet. He didn't know how to be a general yet. And incidentally, those of us who were less than generals, that is, those of us who were colonels and majors and captains, we didn't know how to be colonels and majors and, and captains yet. It took a while. And so I was not with General Washington at the start of the fighting. I did work a little bit with him in 1776, and then in 1777, when we realized that the British were not going to try to take New York, which is what we had thought, but they were going to move to Philadelphia, which was our capital city, I did catch up with Washington's forces. Met one of his uh, prime lieutenants, an arrogant New Yorker, whose politics I sort of liked, but whose personality I didn't, and that was Alexander Hamilton. And, uh, but, but he was an officer, as was I. And, and in one incident there, just following the Battle of Germantown, not far from Philadelphia itself, Alexander Hamilton and I were together, along with about 20 of us, and we were all put together in a small wood by British regulars, and we had a fight with, with pistols and with bayonets. I think I killed two Britishers that day. But then we broke off. Neither Alexander Hamilton nor I was injured. General Washington went on to spend the winter in uh, Valley Forge. I didn't go to Valley Forge. I was back in Virginia for a while. And then beginning in the year 1778, when there was a change in the British strategy and they decided that they would leave Philadelphia and repair to the north into New York, I came back and I rejoined and I was with Washington's men there in Morristown as we were keeping an eye on the British in New York. I loved to fight. I was restless when there was not fighting. Later I received a compliment on my ability to fight and my willingness to fight. When one of the officers said that he liked Henry Lee he liked Henry Lee, and that he thought that Lee had sprung from his mother's womb a soldier. A soldier. And I thought to myself, I need to prove it, and I need for everybody to know it. I need some of the glory that's there. I need for people to recognize that I am the best of all the soldiers. And an opportunity came in 1778 when the British had located just across the river from New York City itself in a place called Paulus Hook. And I took it upon myself with the men under my control to plot a way to go and take Paulus Hook and bring back some prisoners from Paulus Hook. And I made careful plans about it. I brought some of my friends who were under my command together. And we were prepared to follow my plan when a Virginia unit joined us. 
And the commander of that Virginia unit claimed that he outranked me. Well, there was an argument about it between us. I wasn't about to give up my plan and my leadership. And perhaps I stretched the truth a little bit. But I led the charge. And do you know what? We came away with 300 prisoners. And the number of casualties we had? Zero. Not a single casualty. And I had 300 prisoners. I got great compliments, except from those Virginia boys. And they claimed that I had lied, that I had taken away the command from a man who was outranking me, and I had violated all the military protocol. I was court-martialed, court-martialed. But by the way, I was not found guilty of anything. I was absolutely cleared by the court-martial. Furthermore, the Congress dedicated $15,000 to be spread among my men who had gone in on my plan, under my leadership. And for me, a gold medal. In those days, I was a major. Nobody gets gold medals except generals. I was the only one in all of the Americans but I got it on the recommendation of George Washington. That did not sit very well with some of the people in the Congress. You know, you know, we had people in Congress who were politicians, never been soldiers, didn't know how to fight, didn't know how to realize that they were, they were that fighting is not easy. It's not just sitting there pulling triggers. It's careful planning and it's speed, and it's surprise, and it's knowing where to be, when, and when to get away from there. And I knew all those things, and I had demonstrated, and so the Congress agreed with George Washington, and they allowed the establishment of a separate legion. They called it Lee's Legion. Now I'm a colonel, head of Lee's Legion. I outfitted them with uniforms. A little green tinge here and there. That later got us into a little bit of trouble when we were fighting uh, Tarleton down in the south where his men were dressed in green. Uh, not serious problems, except for those who suffered and were, were hit on the battlefield as a result. I was sure that Lee's Legion was going to be the best outfit in the American Army. I drilled them myself. I trained them myself. We had military exercises. And, and I was always in the exercises. And I will say to you, and you can look it up, there is less of those who desert from Lee's Legion than from any other unit. I just didn't have the problem. The men had confidence in me, and I had confidence in them. And then in 1780, after a terrible defeat in Camden, it looked as though the southern part of the United States was, was going to be completely dominated by the British again. There were even rumors afoot that some members of Congress wanted to do that. And that they would promise to, to turn the southern colonies back to England, but keep the rest of the colonies as independents. Nothing ever came of that, but there was talk about it. General Gates, who claimed more credit than he deserved, he had, he had been down to Camden and he was defeated. Charleston had surrendered. There had been a terrible uh, slaughter uh, at, at, uh, of Buford's men up there around the wax halls. Thomas Sumter had been defeated and surprised. And, and we just needed some help for the American cause. If we were going to keep all America together. And I rejoiced when, in addition to sending this man, General Green, 
whom I, whom I respected. He had been the quartermaster general and I had known him. And I respected him. He hadn't been a battlefield commander. I worried a little bit about that. But I was Lee's legion. And while generally I took orders, and I would take orders from General Green, I was still my own man. And I followed my own strategies largely, operating in conjunction with, although technically under the command of General Green and the Americans. So we came south. <laughs> the man in the south that I, I rallied to and that I really liked and who thought, whom I thought was really capable was a native South Carolinian named Francis Marion. I didn't get along very well with other leaders in the South. And as far as possible, I stayed away from General Green and his orders. But Francis Marion and I did well. Now, you, 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 could, hardly, you could hardly imagine a different pair. I was a graduate of Princeton. I still had in my saddlebags books written in Latin, which I read to myself from time to time. I could quote some of the great writers from both Greece and Rome. Francis Marion could barely read and barely write and made all sorts of grammatical errors in the messages that he sent. And I was a graduate of Princeton. My folks back home, they are Virginia planters. We've been the leaders of society for generations in Virginia. Francis Marion, who came from a highly respected family, but not with the background that I had. Not with the background that I had. But somehow or another, we overcame what looked on the surface like differences. But underneath, and in our concepts of how to win, we were together. It, it, it was nice. Now, I had some quarrels with him. Particularly did I quarrel sometimes because Francis Marion usually struck and, and melted away. When I struck, I struck. And the enemy knew I had struck. And I was usually on the battlefield ready to strike again. Oh, I was with Marion's men when we were in Fort Watson. I was amazed at how the uh, Americans took Fort Watson. I was, I was struck by Hezekiah Mayhem. He, he's the man who suggested that we, that we construct a tower that was tall enough for us to shoot down at the British instead of having the British shoot down at us. I was at Fort Granby. I even went with the Legion itself over to uh, uh, Fort Grierson and uh, across the Savannah River and into a little old town there called Augusta. But, but the, the action was in the state of South Carolina. And I will say to you, and you can check it out as well as you wish, we saved South Carolina from the British grasp. When we got here in 1780, South Carolina was, was practically surrendered to the British. And we fought for a year and a half, and South Carolina was free, and the British were gone. A man quarrels over horses. My, my unit, to begin with, had been a cavalry unit, but now it was some cavalry and some infantry. And because Francis Marion wanted to move as fast as I wanted to move, sometimes I had to double up on the horses, and, and, and there was fear that we would wear our horses out. Speed, that's, that's part of the secrets of winning. Surprise. 
because when you surprise, particularly the way we fought, because we attacked at 3 a.m., or we attacked at dawn, or maybe even as late as midnight, and the enemy was not expecting us at the time, and because of the darkness roundabout, and because of my men riding their horses and hooping and hollering, and as far as we could, spreading some fire along the way, we panicked the enemy, and they ran. And sometimes they ran into each other. And, and that's the way we won. We rarely fought a battle where we had more muskets at the firing line than the enemy did. But we concentrated. You know, we, we just knew how to fight. George Washington, having heard from us from time to time, even offered me a position as an aide and then I would come up to Morristown and be with others who were his aides. I didn't want to do that. Who wants to, to be an aide? And that means sitting at a desk or an easy chair all day long and making a few suggestions and agreeing with the others who are around your table. There's no action there. There's no glory there either. And that was something to consider. The glory is sort of a badge where you're certified to be better than the others. I needed certification. And I knew I wasn't going to get into Morristown. So I was happy in the South. Largely happy. Everything wasn't going my way. But we fought. I was a little disappointed at the end of my career. I had been present at a good many of the different battles. One was, was a rather crucial battle at the end of the wartime, looking back on it. It was at Utah Springs. There was much confusion in our ranks in Utah Springs. I was in the charge of a portion of our line, and my men held the line. We fought well. But in the confusion that followed, I had understood my orders to charge that, that the line was going to charge, but there was a, a house, a brick house over here that, that was uh, surrounded uh, or occupied by the British and fortified. And so I understood that I was to take the house and I moved in that direction. And sometimes then the rest of my men didn't know where I was and they couldn't come to me for orders. And, and so we made a charge, did my legion, not under my leadership, and it was not a very successful charge. I had quarrels about that later. I came to General Green and told him that I thought I would detach myself from his command and go back to the North and affiliate with George Washington. It looked like most of the fighting in the South was coming to a conclusion anyway. And General Green, whom I did admire, just wrote back to me and said that he thought that while I had said I was not feeling well and I needed to go back, that he thought my problem was not physical, but it was mental that I was, I was discontented with the way I had been treated and the way I had been received. Looking back on it, maybe he was right. Maybe he was right. But I left the army. And so I was not present at the final capitulation at Utah Springs and Charleston. But I was present in Yorktown. When General Green needed someone to carry his report about the battles at Utah Springs, and because I had expressed my wishes to leave, he gave me the honor of carrying his report to George Washington himself. And I found George Washington at Yorktown. And I was there, having handed in the report. I did not play a prominent role then either in the surrender of Charleston, 
which I would like to have done, or in the surrender at Yorktown by Lord Cornwallis, and I would like to have been there. Instead, I went back home. And in two years, I got married. I married a cousin of mine named Matilda Lee. Oh, a precious, a precious girl. I was in my 40s and she was in her 20s. Uh, we, had, we had four children. Uh, two of them died. That was about the way it went in those days. You expected the children would have a difficult time during their infancy. Once beyond the infancy, you could expect a long lifetime of joy and health. But until you got to that point, it was very, very chancy. She brought with her a considerable dowry. We lived in her house, a beautiful house, Stratford. In 1791, I had, I had just finished serving as, as a representative to the Continental Congress. This was, this was before the, the writing of the Constitution, and the Continental Congress was functioning. And, and the Continental Congress was full of debates and very little action. In fact, in, in any significant law, we had to have a unanimous consent. And it was very difficult to get a unanimous consent. Most of us agreed that the Articles of Confederation under which we were operating was not going to be good enough for us. And the, so the question was, shall we change and what sort of change shall we make? And then, up there in New England, one of the veterans, whose name is Daniel Shays, led a revolution against the tax conditions. And that frightened me a little bit. Legislatures are the ones who ordain taxes, not individuals, and certainly not mobs. And so I fell into the agreement with a great number of people that what we needed was a stronger government. And so I was one of those who voted to call a convention to suggest strengthening the Articles of Confederation. I was not a member of there. It's what, it's what people later on began to call the Constitutional Convention. They didn't have the authority to write a constitution, but they proceeded to do that. And the nation was in such mood that the nation accepted it. As a matter of fact, even I, although I was miffed at, at the effrontery of this group of people, and, and my, my, you know, my friend James Madison is one of those who was there, one of the chief members who was there. But they had written a, a constitution, a, the constitution had been written, and so finally the, Const the Continental Congress, where I was, uh, agreed to the terms of the Constitution. And the more I read it, the better I liked it. And so when the time came to see whether Virginia would join the Union or whether Virginia would continue to be alone was a crucial time we had to have nine states to agree to join the Union. As a matter of fact, New Hampshire became...